Okay, welcome to Director's Dialogue, uh, our virtual conversations with visionary leaders of science, education, biotech, and tonight, the news media. These dialogues offer an inside perspective on the emerging opportunities, challenges, and trends in biomedical science and biotechnology. Our guests share their most meaningful experiences and observations, tell us what excites and concerns them, about the present and future of bioscience and describe innovation that could dramatically affect the future of human health. You can participate as well by submitting questions through the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. Send your questions at any time during the discussion and we'll answer as many of them as possible. Tonight, we begin our second series of dialogues by considering what has begun become a fraught and challenging aspect of our society. The communication about biomedical science and public health. My guests, and this is a special treat, are Linda, Linda Henry and Rick Berker, deal with this challenge every day. Linda is CEO of Boston Globe Media Partners, which includes the Boston Globe, boston.com and Stat News the online reporting service that focuses on healthcare and health policy, biomedical research and the biomedical industry. Prior to becoming the first woman to run the globe, Linda was its managing director. In that role, she helped drive the organization's transformation into a digital co media company, and she strengthened and diversified the company's leadership team. In her spare time, she is a partner in Fenway Sports Group, an Emmy Award-winning television producer, and plays leadership roles with multiple philanthropic foundations and non-for-profit organizations. She earned her bachelor's degree from Babson College and a master's degree from both MIT and the Harvard Kennedy School. Rick? has been an executive editor of STAT since co-founding the service in 2015. Prior to joining STAT, he was executive editor of Politico, but Rick spent most of his career, more than 27 years, at the New York Times. There he serves as chief political correspondent, covering Congress, the White House, and national drug policy. He also served as the Times assistant manager and editor, Washington editor, national editor and political editor. Rick earned his bachelor degree at University of Michigan and his master's degree from Columbia School of Journalism. Welcome to both of you and thanks for joining us. I also want to wish the Red Sox good luck tonight as they strive for an American League title. Um, and um, now tonight we will discuss the challenge of communicating about science. In particular, the problem of misinformation on science, medicine, and public health. Linda, can you tell us how you define misinformation and when does the globe call it out? Um, Ruth, thank you so much for having us here. And this whole series is just phenomenal. Um, so thanks for your leadership. And as I said before, your team has been fantastic. I got the chance to um, to meet Ruth when she first took over uh, the Whitehead. And I've just been so thrilled with uh, how she's taken this institution forward. So um, misinformation is something um, that is really important for us to be aware of in media. We define it as misinformation, as information whose accuracy, inaccuracy is unintentional, unintentional. Disinformation um, is information that is deliberately false or misleading, leading often spread for to discredit or um, for some sort of political gain. We also talk about um, cloak science, which is more relevant to this group, which is disinformation that uses scientific jargon to sound persuasive. Um, disinformation, it's not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for millennia. People have manipulated information and media for their own needs and interests. But what has changed and what we're living right now is the speed at which bad information can get out there and, and really root into and change conversations and beliefs. So at the Globe and at STAT, we are with increasing aggressiveness, point out that something is not factually correct or a lie. 
we do in the body of a story, it could be in a headline. It's a really important part of what we do to highlight the misinformation or disinformation itself, as well as have articles that talk about what, what sort of information or disinformation is the impact of that is. Thanks, yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, Rick, as an editor, how do you decide who is or is not reliable as your information source? Because that's what the, the end comes down to, right? Well, Ruth, it's great to be here. And as you say, this whole issue is really fraught and it's fraught for any news organization. And when we started STAT six years ago, this was top of mind. There was nothing more important than credibility. And we wanted to build a news organization that could be trusted. And I don't need to tell you or, or this audience that science is complicated, messy, and hard. And and as journalists, we have to invest in understanding science so we can convey it to the public. So when we started STAT, the number one thing was hiring or recruiting the top sort, high, most highly sourced authoritative reporters we could find in the US and Canada, who moved, many of whom moved to Boston, um, experts in biotech, pharma, public health, um, uh, life sciences, um, health delivery. And um, so, because there's nothing more important than authority and credibility. So we wanted to have that, um, that trust with the readers from the very beginning. What we didn't anticipate, um, you know, as, as Linda said, disinformation has been out there for years. We could never have anticipated what happened with COVID and how this was on sort of um, overdrive. And suddenly we were in a situation where facts and misinformation were flying left and right constantly. And luckily the way we've identified sources of who we rely on for this information is turning to the reporters who have that background, who have built years of relationships. So we have someone like Helen Brant Branswell covers public health. She knew who to go to around the world to quote the right sources as COVID was unfolding. And let me, let me tell you, Helen and our reporters and all journalists covering the pandemic have been from the very beginning inundated with pleas from people who wanna, want to be authorities, want to be quoted, and and you have to be discerning because I remember Helen repeatedly saying, I'm not quoting this person or why did this organization quote this? This person doesn't know what they're talking about. So what we've relied on is years of building relationships and knowing which scientists to trust. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So it seems like... Um, um, What's sort of the difficult part in this is that we're um, the public com communication about science is kind of in a danger, like you say, either, you know, people, their own interests or by political and social policy parties and um, uh, where the, the facts are sort of much more in the eye of the beholder um, than um, in, in, in the actual truth. And, um, uh, Linda, can you comment to that? Um, because obviously you can you can make sure that within the globe and stat the information is properly communicated. But but how do we counteract the general um, battles about misinformation? I think um, so. That's a that's a very big question. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the part of it is that you know there is there is a difference if you're reading something from a, a an organization that is produces journalism there uh, there are standards it's like you know it's journalists aren't the same as scientists but journalists adhere to some of the same principles and sort of guiding practices in in terms of for for the for the industry so in journalism if it's an established news organization that has credibility, that's their most important thing. And that's something that they're going to continue to produce journalism that adheres to standards and their editors. And yes, there are mistakes that happen and things that get slipped through, but 
then corrections are are issued and it's and it's answered. So I think that while that is a tough question for all of us because we see political polarization that we haven't seen before. Um, and it's hard for us all when we see information being spread that is ridiculous. But the answer is for us as these um, you know, quality journalistic institutions to do our job with as much authority as possible. Um, you know, People who are reading the globe and stat are people that understand science the most. We talk about how within Boston, we have one of the most educated um, public, the most educated subscriber base of any newspaper. And stat is that nationwide. Um, and so if you're trying, if it, the people you're trying to convince that vaccines are safer are already reading our publications, we have to get our content out to a wider audience, one, and then also be that resource that other people can check if they hear something from another source that doesn't sound right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I read it. I, I read a report by the by the by the Pew uh, uh, Foundation, and uh, they they asked people um, whether information environment will improve or will not improve, and it was basically 50-50 of um, experts <laughs> going one way or the other. And so I was wondering, Rick, uh, do you think that the nature of dis misinformation changed over the past couple of decades? Ab absolutely, I think uh, the politicization of science has been at a level we've obviously never seen before. And, and let me just base, basically say that the, the sort of the partisanship in our, and, and, and in our political institutions is, and, and the questions raised about our scientific leaders are sort of unheard of. And I think back to when 9-11 happened, which I think was, so the last time there was a big, huge, crisis that every single person in the, in the in this country and in the world was affected by. And I was covering politics for the New York Times. And I remember thinking, this is really hard for me to do my job because everyone was coming together. Like there was no political um, tension. Everyone, Republicans, Democrats. I remember writing a story on the front page about how the Republican Senate leader and the Democratic Senate leader hugged each other on the Senate floor, which had been unheard of. So there was this coming together. So when COVID happened, one would expect, I certainly from journalistic ex uh, expectation thought, science, everyone will come together and in fighting this, this virus and following the science and the public health experts. But look what happened. It just, it happened, <laughs> that didn't happen. And it's been really difficult for society, for journalists, for scientists, for everyone to sort of to absorb that. But we have to just keep pushing through with the most credible information and not letting that noise um, distract us. But the, but the issue is the question that you raise is how do people that read the Globe and Stat are pretty educated and pretty much know um, I, I think we can trust them to want to know the science, but how do you reach these other audiences that um, don't get their news necessarily from credible sources? Yes, and how, um, if it is a, like you were alluding to, if it is a bipartisan problem, uh, or, or a problem of non-bipartisanism, um, then that becomes even worse, right? Um, so that must be among your readers. Are people looking for the information that is associated, even for health, that is associated with their political affiliation? Right, and I would say even among stats readers, I mean, we pride ourselves as being not writing about politics, writing about science and the facts, but even stat readers, we got some feedback and surveys from some readers saying, why are you, um, you know, cut up, cut, uh, stop with the politics. And, and there's nothing we've ever done that's politically slanted one way or the other, but there were moments when you had to write about what Trump was saying and proposing that 
and you had to sort of truth squad the reality. And to some people, even some of our readers, they said, you know, that's that's being political. So it's it's really tricky for for journalists. Um, Rick, I, you had a really great article out today. I think that that highlights a way of of handling. Um, political stories from a scientific lens. Can you can you share that story? Yeah, we, we, we had a story um, that headlined, politics is derailing the crucial debate over immunity you get from recovering from COVID. And the point made in that story is, you know, we all know there's natural immunity that can help us against COVID, but there's, there's real scientific division over the extent to which that benefits someone. And it's, it's a really, valid debate. And so what we tried to explain in that story is how this is one instance where a, a valid, genuine scientific debate um, is front and center. And it's not quite as, I mean, people are trying to score political points with it, but it's not, but, but they're valid arguments on all sides. So we try to highlight some of those examples and um and 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 what we also try to do is um just write about whenever we can um we spend a lot of time and effort to dig deeply into um i mean into deep questions um about science we have a, a big investigation that took several months that's running tomorrow called Selling Certainty. And it's about, the, the whole point of it is, there's so many skeptics out there about uh, fibromyalgia. And we, there's a doctor that we identified who's sort of selling his, his treatment to patients. And we, through a very deep months of investigation, raised some questions about, about the validity of what he's doing scientifically. And these kinds of stories you can't do it in a day or a week or a month. You have to spend a lot of time um, getting it right. And that's, that's, it's very hard because a lot of, a lot of journalists and, and journalism organizations don't have the resources or the reporters who, who dare write about such complicated science. Because it takes time to read and most people read in very short, Bits. And, and Ruth, let me just say this story that's running tomorrow is 7,000 words. And part of me thinks- I don't oh my, get those oh that many. God, I, I kind of think people on their phone, are they gonna, how do we get them to read this story? 7,000 words. But, but uh, you know, I can only hope that we, we push it out to the right audiences and they'll reward us for our diligence and the resources that we put into doing this story. Yeah, oh, that's great. That uh, happens, by the way, more often in digital publications than in print publications. <laughs> the long, the long versions. The seven thousand word piece. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Although I think the format where most people are reading on their phone, those long publications be, do do cause probably a pro, uh, you know some problem. Um, but uh, it it is really. Uh, I, th I think we're, we're really touching on how do you actually um, uh, get to um, where, where organizations like the Globe and STAT can help people um, to learn to be more aware also and less vulnerable to misinformation. So not only assuming, oh, when I read the Globe, it's tested. Um, when I read stat, I can trust that data, but how when they influence by other data on their phone through Twitter, whatever, Facebook, um, how can we help people to actually be able to discriminate between um, valid information and misinformation? I can I can touch on this one. Um, so part of it is, you know, what what it, part of the when people talk about oh, there are some studies that talk about the lack of trust in media, and I actually dove pretty deeply into this. That there is, if you say overall media, that encompasses all of the cable news channels, right? But if you get down to 
do you trust your local news organization? The trust level there is actually fairly high. And so wherever you're, you're, the people joining us today are joining from, whatever your local news newspaper, news organization is, supporting and subscribing to that is actually really important. And there is a, a strong basis of trust there. Um, same thing with um, uh, you know, the scientific journals, these sort of these niche publications that have real accountability to, to a specific audience like STAT has, there is a high level of trust there as well. And so organizations like the Globe and STAT um, have to be the reliable resource every day. They have to be um, transparent. They have to have journalistic principles. Um, you know, if there's something that journalists don't know, they don't fake it. They are able to say, we don't know this and we should know this. And here's who needs to be telling us what the answer to this question is. Um, and so amid raging culture wars, the key for a place like this, like Stat and for the Globe is to not get caught up in that and be the reliable place that and maintain the trust that we've built up over years and centuries. But news organizations are struggling, right? It is hard to have um, people still buying into news organizations and buying the news, listening to their local news, supporting their news, their, their, their newspapers. Um, so, so in a way, what you're saying is, if we got more people kind of actually relying on the way that we were relying on the kind of way how they were relying to the, on the news as they used to do, then we could really change this. But that it, may yeah. not be the trend. Or do you see actually a trend where this is, is coming back and people are saying, oh, I actually, uh, I, I feel like I'm, I, I really rely on, the, on, on my local news, on my local newspaper. I think that for both for both the Globe and uh, Rick can talk about this as well as for for Stat, we saw a huge increase in subscribers uh, during the pandemic. You know, when things were when when the news mattered so much more to your life, and you know, during the pandemic, how things were playing out locally really mattered. And for Stat, Stat was, you know. Um, there, <laughs> you know, that was built for for to be a reliable source during during a pandemic, and you know we're ready for the next pandemic because, which we hope doesn't happen, but because we built up this muscle of being able to really interpret and and report on complex scientific issues. But for you know, I've I've only been in journalism for eight years. Um, Rick has been in there for for a lot longer. But we've we've turned both of these organizations into strong, thriving, stable organizations. The Globe is strong, stable, growing, expanding. Uh, Stat is on fire, and we just keep investing. So we are able to take um, because our subscribers have grown. We're just investing that into additional coverage and adding more beats and more um, more in depth coverage. At the Globe, we have. Uh, a team of five science journalists and we're adding uh, more where it's going to be one of our largest teams, dedicated teams on on covering hospitals and life sciences. And Rick is just expanding into um, more areas of life sciences and finding people who have that expertise and credibility and know how to do this. And, and I would just add that's absolutely true. And I would just add, also add for all the the, the the issues of misinformation that we're discussing, as Linda said, there's a good news story here about journalistic institutions. Stat, for example, um, just to, to give you a metric, um, last in beginning of last year, our average readership was one and a half million a month, which is not bad, and it's fine. We were progressing well, respected, uh, but. In March of 2020, we went from 1.5 million that month to 24 million. 24 million people turning to stat for credible information. It was like, it's like you just couldn't, we couldn't keep up with the interest. We were worried the site would, would crash. Yeah. And it's settled since then, but it's much, much higher than it ever was because people are coming to us because they want 
they are seeking us out. And one of the stories that's that's our mo one of our most popular in our history that's still very popular on our site is a story that Helen Branswell has done comparing the three COVID vaccines. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a just the facts comparing like very detailed information that's very understandable and accessible, but they trust Helen and we update that. We just updated a few days ago with the new developments, but people just flock to our site for that kind of distilled, understandable, trustworthy information. So there is, there are people out there who seek out credible journalism, both at STAT and the Globe. So I guess a pandemic motivates people to seek out uh, scientifically valid information, but you know, how do you do it beyond the pandemic? Do you think now you have, you, you created an appetite that's gonna continue? Oh yeah, I think for STAT, our audience is, there's no going back to what we were pre-pandemic. People have turned to us for, as a reliable source and people have discovered STAT that hadn't before. And I think also people are interested more in science than they ever would. Like, were, like we had people who um, pre-pandemic, whose beats were drug development, pharma, biotech, who spent years covering these areas. Um, and suddenly they're in the middle of this huge story. And as you know, Ruth, and the, and the people in this audience, you can't learn drug development in, in a month or a year or two years. We have you know people like Matt Herper who've been covering this for 20 years. And, um, Ed Silverman, people have de de devoted decades to covering pharma, drug development, and it's and no one needs to tell me because I'm new, relatively new to this science and health arena since coming to STAT. Um, this is hard stuff and it's complicated and we have to um, rely on people who have spent years puzzling through these, um, these really tough stories and understanding it, understanding them and knowing what sources to go to. That's really important. So maybe let's turn it around, um, uh, Linda and Rick both. Um, uh, how can scientists and, and scientific organization um, uh, help, right? So uh, what can we do? Um, uh, how can we be just plain better or um, uh, help um, that people can hear and understand and accept information? So what, what, what do you say to all of the scientists here? Um, what, what should we do better and how could we help? So I have sort of two questions. Okay, I have I have very strong opinions on this. And, <laughs> uh, so, um, so I think that you know we are so lucky in Boston, and I realize your audience might be beyond, but really things are amazing in Boston because we have so many incredible institutions here, and and you know at the Globe and at Stat we acknowledge and celebrate that we have some of the most important healthcare institutions and life science institutions in the world, not just, a, not just the country. It's really, really spectacular. That said, the more powerful an institution is, the more transparent they have to be. And we've done a number of stories um, with, that all came from people within those organizations that, which we understand they're big complex places, but they were raising an alarm about something that they felt wasn't right. These are employees at your own places and they weren't getting heard and they came to trusted news organizations like STAT and the Globe to help shine a light on what was going on. And so, you know, and, and when, we, when that happens, the, the reaction of institutions often in our experience has been, how could you question us? We're doing such important work here as opposed to the sort of accepting that yes, you are doing great and important work and you have a complex organization that could be doing things that maybe aren't ideal. You know, in 2015, we had articles on concurrent surgeries that were going on. And then we had, uh, very recently, we had articles on trustees at Dana-Farber and 
We before that we had a hospital executive serving on significant for-profit boards and putting them in potentially compromised situations. All of these stories came from people within the organization. So understanding that your organizations are doing really, really important work and they are they they need to be transparent and you know accept that yes, they can also still be doing things better in some in some ways. Yeah. I, I, if I could add, I think that's absolutely true. And one other thing that I think both scientists and journalists need to work on is uh, communicating even better and more clearly and sharply. I don't see a lot of scientists who are, and people in the academic world who are that engaged in on social media in a way that's thoughtful and helpful. And it's really hard because you're trying to make a point and you have very few characters and you don't want to be, um, you know, flip about what you're saying. So it's, it's really hard for both journalists and scientists, but I think we all need to do better with how we communicate uh, scientific information. And I think we all have to be careful, both journalists and scientists about um, being patient with people who are skeptical of science and the media, um, repeating what we know to believe um, is true and not be, be accessible, but not condescending in our, in, our, um, in our coverage. And I think the other thing that's, I think, important both for journalists and the science community is diversity is so important. And we all like we all need to do better because if you're if you're from an underserved community and you're hearing from or a community that's not doesn't get equal access to health care and you're hearing from a panel of just all white male scientists or all white male journalists that may not be a good way of community you're not reaching certain audiences so i think we all need to um we all need to take that challenge. So what would you suggest for um, scientists who, you know, and a lot of our trainees are very interested in the aspect that you just said, right? They would like to reach out. They would like to learn um, how to communicate better. Um, what, do you have any suggestions? If I, I would, I would reach out to maybe some specialists who can help with public communication to help um, give tips on, on communicating. And um, I, I would also say there's, there's, there's something that's, that's concerning to, to journalists about some journalists who really don't know what they're talking about science. And, but I think the same thing happens in the science in your community. The, it must drive you crazy when you see people who they're, they have doctor in front of their names and they pronounce themselves experts on the pandemic when they have no, no understanding or background in infectious diseases. So, so I think, um, I don't know what we do about those sort of imposters, both in journalism and science, but the people who really know what they're talking about need to get out there and be more plain spoken about communicating their points. Yeah, and I feel the earlier the better. So this has to, this really has to be part of the training from very early on. Um, and we're probably not doing such a good job in training um, scientists to really communicate, not just to each other, but really to the, um, I, I think probably talking to people like you, talking to journalists who, who know a lot about science is already a good step forward. I mean, it's probably an easier step. I would also, I would add to that, that I agree with, with what Rick's saying and that when people know that there is a strong, credible uh, media organization that is holding institutions accountable, it also increases trust. It sort of encourages and promotes um, transparency as well as um, allows more people to feel like they can trust that the place that they're working with is being held accountable to somebody other than their own board of directors. And we also as journalists have an um, 
obligation when we can to call out the people who are um, posers, uh, who really don't, uh, are spreading um, information that's, that's not credible. And one example that we did in um, STAT in last May was, um, of, and this we spent months on this piece because we thought it was important for, for, for public consumption. We spent months investigating a Professor Michael Levitt at Stanford, mm -hmm. who is a Nobel Prize winner. Um, but um, we made the case in a very journalistic, fair way that he was dangerously misleading on COVID. And he used his platform as a Nobel winner to, to do that. We gave him plenty of opportunity to talk to us. We poured through what he wrote and what he said. We talked to his associates and we spent months getting it right. But, but we found it an obligation to the public to like not let people who should like who are getting away with things get away with them. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that's great. Um, we've been discussing some very concrete issues. Uh, so let me touch on something a bit more philosophical. So Ed Young, the, the, the science writer at the Atlantic, recently wrote that the pandemic clarified that science is inseparable from the rest of society. Uh, science touches on everything, everything touches on science. So he asks, uh, what even counts as science writing? How might we, you know, how are you thinking you know, about science writing in the years ahead? Because science is so important as you have been really um, uh, so, so eloquently expressing during this uh, hour. I'll start and then I'll let, let Rick bring it home because um, at the Globe, and at STAT, we have been investing in the future and we really believe that, you know, particularly in Boston and actually, the, so the future is being built at the intersection of art, science and technology. That's sort of where the world is. And we have an obligation to, to be there. You know, pandemics change everything, but we didn't wait for a pandemic to invest in science writing. We built the biggest dedicated life science organization in the country, which is STAT News. And those investments helped us be prepared to produce the type of writing that is founded in fact, which is what I would define um, science writing to a certain degree as is sort of based on real, real research um, is, that's going through. There's a there's one there's one aspect within science writing that I'd also like to talk about before I turn over to Rick is that there is this false equivalency point that. Um, was very, was sort of the, the journalistic standard. And one of the ways that it's popularly talked about now is um, uh, climate change. That if you were writing an article before about climate change, you then had to find somebody who disagreed with climate change to show that you were unbiased in your reporting. And the rules in journalism have changed that from, you know, you, you had from having to provide even coverage both sides that if you are knowledgeable, you have to trust that you know what you are talking about and not just give people a platform which can lead to confusion and open the door for misinformation and disinformation. So that for, for us, science writing is something that we are deeply committed to and we've been investing really heavily in as a, to be that sort of trustworthy, reliable news organization. Yeah. And I would just add that, um... Uh, to your question about Ed Young, I think he's absolutely right about these are stories that touch everyone. In fact, when we um, we before we launched Stat six years ago, we wrote up a mission statement. We all sat down and said, "What is the point of Stat?" And the kicker to this day on that mission statement is these are the stories that matter to us all, and that is how we see our journalism. And let me just say. When John and Linda Henry approached me about starting STAT, um, mm -hmm. as I said, I didn't have a background in covering science. It was a more broadly journalistic background. Um, but I went, but they made the case that Boston is the epicenter of life sciences. And this is a story that touches everyone in the world. So I went to, my first stop was Kendall Square where I started talking to people 
and interviewing people. <laughs> I went to Kendall Square and um, I even moved there temporarily at the beginning to soak in Kendall Square to a hotel there and for a couple of months. And what sold me on doing this was people that I talked to, when I asked them about science and what was going on, I thought, these are great stories. And I'm not a science uh, journalist, but these are great stories that it doesn't matter if you've spent year, you know, what your specialty is. These are stories that haven't been told, that need to be told. And we could start an organization, a news organization with worldwide influence that can tell these stories. And these are that's what science journalism, it's not this narrow thing. Our challenge is not to write these boring um, trade publications or journal articles. Our challenge is to write authoritative, provocative, accessible, and reliable science that people, that a general audience of millions of people can find illuminating, but that also people in the scientific community, like people in this audience can read and say, you know, that's really readable, but it's not talking down to me. I can, I'm, I'm learning something from it. And that's, that's our challenge. And, and I think you can, we can do both. I love this. It sounds really like breaking down this barrier, right? Where, you know, science is inaccessible because I don't have a degree because I didn't take biology or whatever, right? And, and, and I think, uh, I think that's, a, that's a really, uh, I think that's a, that's a really, really good concept. Um, I know, Linda, I think you may have to leave. Um, good luck <laughs> tonight. <laughs> And uh, and tomorrow, <laughs> and, thank you. Uh, and uh, we're gonna now uh, go to some question and answers from 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 from, from uh, those who have been listening to this incredible, uh, interesting conversation. Thank you. Bye, Linda. Bye, Linda. So, um. So one of the first questions we got was that, um, and this is, it almost picks directly up from what we were just talking about. Uh, and it says that uh, it seems that there is a higher degree of distrust of science today. And that I think that speaks somewhat to that barrier that we were just talking about. Um, and, you know, is there a path back to more trust? And is it maybe those stories that you were just talking about uh, that could I, do that? I, I hope there's a path back, but, um, and I think we as journalists and scientists need to do everything we talked about to, to communicate better to the public and bring clarity and authority to science. But I think some of it's, a lot of it's out of our hands too, because when you have, um, leaders of political leaders spouting bad information, it's, I don't know what you do about that. And it's really degraded the, um, I think, public trust in our scientific institutions. Um, you know, I, I re <coughs> excuse me, I remember during, um, you know, the AIDS crisis, how there was a lot of politicization of what Reagan was doing or not doing and what Tony Fauci was doing and and speed up drug development and those were and looking back that felt like a valid use of sort of political energy to sort of raise the awareness but what we're seeing now when you see the same scientist Tony Fauci being pilloried by people for spreading bad information when the reality is, again, um, we we wish as journalists and you wish as scientists that we had all the answers. I wish we could have written a story a month or two ago or whenever on this is what you should do with boosters and this is the best advice. But but Helen Branswell and our other reporters were very careful because we don't we don't we didn't know. Just like Tony Fauci. Um, if you, you could look back and look at some of the things he said and might take back, but everyone was trying to do the best they could under a, a fast moving story where we don't even to this day know how it ends. And um, 
at, we've tried as journalists to respect the science and respect the process and know that the answers aren't easy. And it's exasperating and frustrating when people are dying, but you have to respect the science. Yeah, I think it's very hard to understand that uh, that how science is that you know when you don't know. I mean, you, it's it's a pro process, and right. uh, and hypotheses change, and uh, dependent on the data that come in. If you don't, if you have very little data, um, you can't do very much. And I think that's uh, I think that is so clearly. Uh, 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 outlined in uh, what happened, right? And all this, you know, backlash. Yeah, first he said we should do that, and then he said we should do that. And right. you know, uh, without, you know, we, we knew so little about about and, it. And I'm when when you talk about sort of authority, I'm one of the things I'm most proud of during the early days of the pandemic is I look back at the tape of Helen Branswell moderated a panel. Um, for the Aspen Institute in Washington. And it, there was Tony Fauci on the panel and Ron Klain, who then be later became chief of staff to Biden and a, a couple other big name, really credible people. And, our, and Helen stopped the conversation as moderator and said, aren't you worried about China and this virus coming? She was confident enough because she had covered this stuff. She was, she interrupted Tony Fauci and said, aren't you worried? And that's not a, um, and she has enormous respect for him and for the other people, but these are, that's why it's so important to have um, journalists who are confident in asking the questions and saying what they know and what they don't know and bringing their authority to bear. And I remember her asking the then, um, the, the then uh, CDC, head of the CDC, why are you absent during a public health crisis? Why don't we see you? And it wasn't a political question. It was a reality question. If she had seen decades of health crises in this country with a CDC person was out front and she could say with authority, why aren't you out there, Dr. Redfield? And so that's why journalists we trust that we trust and have the authority are so important. Yeah. Let's return to one other question we got here in our chat box. How do those reliable sources of information engage those that seek information elsewhere because of distrust, shared non-science values, or lack of access? How do how do the the reliable people engage the unreliable. Exactly. So how do you deal? Do you deal directly with misinformation? You're calling it out, but then it's so much. And should you bother? It's, it's hard. How do you get to? How do you identify these people? And I think that are um, and, and I think part of the issue and we've seen studies of um, of of, you know, of uh, like people like you know Heidi Larson, the uh, uh, the Vaccine Confidence Project have raised some of these issues where people seem to seek out uh, information that affirms their worst fears or their their point of view. So how do you break that? And it's a challenge not only in reaching those people, but in doing our journalism because um, in writing about some of the um, communities most affected by COVID, um, including some of the um, Native American communities, Black communities. Um, we, our reporters um, last year really invested time to win the trust of people that they wanted to write stories about because um, a lot of people that we wanted to interview felt burned or distrust or not trusting the media. And we, we, we really have tried to, it, it's a process to win over people to write about in stories. But I think the more you do that, the more you can sort of reassure people that, and, and write about communities that may have been over, overlooked. I mean, we had, um, a 
um, um, a reporter spend a, a, a photojournalist last year spend about eight months in southern states last year or earlier this year rather um, spending time um, getting welcomed into um, rural black communities that were um, touched by COVID and what they were going through and how in you know, Palm Beach, everyone was getting vaccin vaccinated and treatments and communities right next door weren't. But our reporter, um, uh, Bethany Molnkoff spent months to win over the trust. And he, she did this big photo essay of, you know, um, you know, of communities in the South that no one had had documented or chronicled during this pandemic. Uh -huh. So here we have a stat specific question. I'm curious about the readership of stat. What percentage is local? I mean, now you have to talk about the 1.5 million or the 24 million. Right, right. <laughs> uh, what percent is local, the Northeast, US wide and international? Um, and that's also how has it changed during the pandemic? You already that's, kind of talked a little bit about this earlier. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Cause I, I think people are surprised when I tell them the answer. We're based in, <laughs> Boston, but our biggest readership is we're international. About a quarter of our audience is international, and it's been that way from the start. Wow. Um, and our biggest audiences are California and New York, um, because um, though there's a lot of interest in health and medicine and science, but also because they're big states and lots of people. So um, Massachusetts, we have a very you know, we're based here, we have very healthy readership and, but it's just not as big. So you're not gonna have as many people. So it's a different demographic than the globe, which is for, the globe has some beyond Boston for people who, who wanna keep up with Boston and because of the, the, the world influencing institutions here and people who used to live in Boston, but we have a, a truly genuinely international audience and what i would say about um about about the audience is we have a combination of our stat plus audience and our general free audience stat plus and our it's about half and half in terms of the stories our stat plus audience are the people who pay and we 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 actually also do you know academic discounts i think whitehead and mit have a a, a whole free campus wide, you know, access. But anyway, so I'm not pitching this group <laughs> at all, but um, you already read it. But Stat Plus is um, the people who pay for subscriptions are the hardcore people in science and health who live and breathe those stories. And also the, the areas around them, like the academic institutions, the research institutions, the legal institutions, the sort of circles around that core science community. Our free audience, um, and we, we sort of made a decision early on in the pandemic to provide most of our COVID covered free, coverage free as a public service. And that's how we got the, ended up with the 26 million. Um, so we have a really, um, huge audience you know of millions of people um that read us regularly for the broader um general interest sort of public health stories we also have our first opinion forum which is more sort of our op-ed and most of those are free because we like to provide a forum for scientists for the industry for patients to sort of have a forum uh, to get their points of view out. So do you have journalists embedded in, 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 in the New York, other scientific areas or hubs? Yeah, I just had, um, we have about, um, including our business team, we have about 12, 10 or 12 people in New York. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, Cal LA, San Francisco. Um, we have, um, and in this, as you know, in this COVID world, um, it doesn't always matter where you are. So frankly, we have a reporter in Mexico City and she's 
and I hired her during the pandemic and I thought like Mexico City but she said Rick it's like it's a closer time zone than if I were in LA and it's and you don't even notice that she's not there so we try to bring people together I had a dinner for the New York team a week ago and we try but with COVID it's it's hard but um but we we've become a truly um sort of national and we've done some international coverage where we have people um uh, well beyond boston writing stories for us that's great um i think we have one more question although i think we we kind of touched on that um it's coming back i think people are really struggling with the biased um, um so um, uh, but here is, uh, is, is, is a question of, um, you talked about calling out non-scientists. How do you call out or take momentum away from the non-journalists? Like the people, what does that mean? Like the, the, the people who aren't journalists who are just spreading Mm -hmm. bad information but doing it right in a journalistic way I oh think. oh i see you know about you know and i think you were even mentioning that earlier yeah yeah i i think there's journalists and they're journalists and there's um there are people who mean well but don't really um understand science um and some of the gen more general interest publications and then there are people that just have no business spreading false information on social media. And, you know, um, there's an organization, a nonprofit called NewsGuard that monitors misleading information. And we, we, we wrote a piece that they wrote for our first opinion section that said there are a lot of health websites that are, no, that are notoriously misleading about COVID. So groups like NewsGuard are out there trying to call them out. And we try to sort of encourage that, but it's like the spigot of information. How do you, I, I don't know, I don't know how, how, you, how you deal with it. Like we all see things that are um, uh, really, that you know are wrong, that are exasperating and frustrating. And you, you saw things, what, what, whatever political party you're in, you see things from, you saw things from, the last president that, were, that you knew were wrong. And frankly, we've also written, we've called out Biden, we've written pieces. It's not like Trump, but we've written pieces holding him accountable where we said, he said, I'm gonna be a president focused on the science. Well, we've, we've brought those words back and written stories about how sometimes pol politics have gotten in the way of science even for a president who believes in science. And I'm not, I don't wanna be judgmental. It's hard being president, it's hard running, governing, but, but uh, we all need to do better and it's all very hard and it's all fast moving. Um, I hope you don't mind. Our, our audience seemed to be really warming up here <laughs> and asking you all the questions. I'll ask you one more question sure. because I think uh, it's kind of getting a little more uh, uh, general. Um, uh, I hope it's not you... like, oh my God, they're like, what's he saying? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> no, I haven't seen that. <laughs> How do you decide which stories to focus on? I find media sometimes go for catchy stories, but perhaps where the scientific evidence is not as strong. I think that's an interesting. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I, um, I pride myself on, I don't think catchy is bad. I don't, I don't think provocative is bad. Um, whether I was at the uh, Stat or the New York Times or Politico, you want to sort of write stories that that draw people in that are interesting, that are credible and interesting. I don't think it's bad to have a story that's compelling and filled with, um, with, with inside details and information that animate a subject. I mean, that's what, I think that's what great journalism tries to do. What I do think is you can't do it at the expense of facts and, um, and you can't focus on stories that aren't really stories. You can't sort of make up 
um, stuff or go for sensationalism for the sake of it. Everything that we do, we try to do, um, it, it's gotta be real. We're very careful, very careful about what studies we write about and what's credible and what's been peer reviewed and what hasn't. Our, our you know, part of my role as uh, an editor is to push for interesting angles. And um, we had one of our most um, uh, sort of impactful stories in our history was um, I asked this sort of good dumb question of, of our legendary uh, late Sharon Begley, I said, why is there no cure for Alzheimer's? And she said, you know, people say there's a cabal of academics and scientists and stuff. I said, well, write that for next week. And she said, I, I, can't, I can't write that until I, that's my hunch from decades of covering, but I don't have the facts. She spent months and months building her sources and getting that story to write a very compelling eye-opening story about why there's no Alzheimer's cure after 30 years, all the promise. And that's the kind of thing, like there are no shortcuts to great journalism and impactful journalism, but we have the luxury of having people that know what they're doing and people like Sharon who would push back and say, Rick, I need time and I need to be patient and we need to do it right. That, that, that's great. And that's, I think that's also very interesting. Something we have to deal with now is that, well, here was this vaccine done, you know, in record time. And then there are diseases we have been working with for a long, long time. And why, why you can't expect the same process progress. And why is that? So, right. So I think that that is uh, for the future, um, really important. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rick, and obviously Linda as well uh, for joining joining me tonight and uh, uh, making this a truly memorable addition to our di director's dialogue series. Uh, I so greatly enjoyed our conversation and I'm sure our audience, who we unfortunately cannot see, did as well. <laughs> well thank you, Ruth. I really, um, I, um, I, I'm really glad you're raising awareness of, I think this is really important to talk about and I'm grateful and I know Linda is to have the opportunity to talk about a little bit about how we do what we do. And we so res respect the Whitehead Institute and what you all do. Um, so thank you for having us. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you who joined us today. Um, we'll hope uh, that you uh, join us next month uh, when my guest will be Kevin Churchwell, the president and CEO of Boston Children's Hospital the world's most respected pediatric hospital. And that event will take place on Tuesday, November 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, you all know the Whitehead Institute is an extraordinary place. And I hope that you will take some time to learn a bit more about our work and what is going on and the discoveries made at the Institute. Please go to our website, wi.mit.edu to learn more about our research there you can sign up for Pulse, our monthly newsletter, and if you choose, make a gift to support our crucial work. And until next time, please stay safe and be well. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Rick, and we see each other in a moment.